Welcome to Meet Your Neighbor. I'm here to talk with Norman Schneider today, who's going to tell us about his life, um, being a part of a neighborhood as a child, how he, how a village helped to take care of him, and he has been uh, paying it forward ever since, uh, making community, reaching out to many groups of people and bringing together as family and providing health and well-being and uh, goodness of life uh, wherever he goes. Let's go and hear what Norman has to say. Hello, Norman. Thank you for meeting with us today here in Zoom, uh, where we're having Meet Your Neighbor interview together in the comfort of your own home. And you're there in Midway? In Midway, that's right. Yes, yep. that's right. Um, and uh, I know you have been a neighbor and part of uh, Hopkinton community for years as well in the programs that you have participated and performed in over here. And I know a little bit of your story and I'm delighted that you're here today to talk for a little while. I know your story is much larger than that, but see if we can get a little essence of uh, getting to know you and who you are. Um, so you live in Medway, and I know part of your story, Norman, is about how in childhood you were in a way raised by a village, right? Uh, as I recall, um, different people were involved in your upbringing. Uh, right and uh, childhood and and I remember your comments about the importance of neighborhood in particular which I, I thought was important as part of your story because I th I think when I think about you and the different work that you've done in community over time that you are a village uh, you know paying forward to the people that you have known and worked with and helped along the way um, so I'd like to say thank you in advance for that and uh, wondering uh, what you might like. Oh, well, yeah. What would you like to share maybe from back in time? Uh, did you grow up in Medway and what do you have to say about uh, your neighborhood and your childhood? No, I, I was born in Worcester out by uh, Lake Winsigaman, right down by, not on the lake, but right up near the lake. Oh, and it was quite a it was quite a different it was a very mixed neighborhood there were a lot of german people and irish and italian and the little groups throughout the the neighborhood and my father died when i was four and a half so my mother went back to work and we lived in in the same house as my grandparents so my grandmother and i took care of me for a while and then she died and my grandfather took care of me for a while and he he loved cheese. And one of the, my favorite meals was he'd make spaghetti with Roquefort cheese in it. Ah, mm -hmm. And I tried that about a, a week ago and it was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but then um, when I started going to school, they, my, I, uh, I had a grandmother on the other side of the family that was about as you know, about a quarter mile from the school. So I'd go to her house and have lunch. And then she died. And the minister and his wife started taking care of me for, you know, to give, have my meals at noontime. Mm -hmm. And then when he wasn't there, his he had two daughters and one of the daughters would take care of me and, and, you know, make sure I had food and all that. So I was, and I, you know, people said that must have been awful losing all those people, but I had such a large group of people that were around and they took care of me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my mother would work and she'd come home and then I'd, I'd be with her. But during the daytime, there was different people paid attention to, you know, where I was. And then. Uh, it does at, sound like a village in a way, uh, looking after you from what years? Uh, yeah. Like. Um, well, I was I moved out of there when I was 12 years old. Mm -hmm. So I, I, from the time I started kindergarten, okay. in fact, I even went. My grandfather took me to a pre-kindergarten, and I, I remember the things where the place was at the top of a great big hill, and when he came to pick me up, he'd get a sled in the winter and walk it up the hill, and we'd slide down the hill down to his car. Wow. <laughs> That's a grand way to uh, exit and go into a car. Hmm? Right, right. <laughs> 
it, it's sort of interesting what you remember, you know, yeah. from yeah. from things. And gave you some good moments that way, I'm sure, right? Yes. What kid wouldn't like that. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then uh, I ended up moving to Paxton. My mother remarried, and I ended ended up in Paxton. And I went to uh, Wentworth Institute, mm. and I started working. And then, oh, along along came this this lady that I met, yes. and we ended up getting married. And that was in 1969, and we were both skiers. So we, we cooked at a ski lodge in the weekends, and then we I worked down in Massachusetts at General Electric during the day, the uh, you know during the week. And what was your work there? I was a draft. I started out as a draftsman, mm -hmm. and it was a clock and timer division. Mm -hmm. And I they had some. It was a, a fellow that was a designer, and he he got laid off, and they needed somebody to do work. So I ended up doing way above what I, I would usually have done there during that time. And then I got bored with uh, work there and I started traveling around to different companies. I worked in Melrose and Wilmington. And then I ended up in a, a company in uh, Burlington, Mass. So I worked there for nine years and I was a, it was a small company. I had about nine employees. Wow. And then I had due to some interesting things happened. Uh, I ended up working at Bose Corporation, right? Yeah. which I worked there for 28 years. And during that time in, in the town of Medway, I, I ended up uh, interested in the historical society and I showed too much interest and I ended up as the president for 21 years. Oh my goodness. That's a long time <laughs> to be a president. Huh? And kept, and it kept going. So, and there's, there's, you know, the, there's a continuation of uh, things. My wife opened a holistic center, and during that time, we we met an awful lot of people. Yes. Well, what does a holistic center offer the community? Well, this was back in 1983, before the before life uh, before holistic was a big thing. Hmm. And my wife was a social worker, and she had was doing work out of the house, and she decided that it social work only was part of the thing. I mean, social work basically works with your mind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when when you're having problems with the mind, the body has problems too. Mm -hmm. So she decided to open a holistic center and we rented some a couple rooms down the street. And she had a, a massage therapist and another social worker, and then decided there wasn't enough enough space. So it started uh, make adding on to that we ended up with 12 12 rooms and 15 people working there you know fifa wow. service i remember stopping by there at some point probably in the 90s would it have been yeah it, uh -huh. yeah. She had it for 10 years uh-huh and you became part of the group there in a way learning from people and uh, involved with some healing right right well i i ended up with asthma pretty in pretty bad bad shape and my wife had gotten a, an acupuncturist and a homeopathic nurse that came to work at the holistic center so i i went to those them to see if i could get you know get some relief from the asthma and then i asked my doctor if it was you know if acupuncture was, was worth trying and he said yes so i went to him went to the acupuncturist and after about uh, two months the acupuncturist said i really can't ask you to do this but uh, I can't tell you to do this, but maybe you could cut down on your medication for the mm. for the asthma. Yeah. What was happening is about every six weeks, I'd have to go back into the walk-in clinic because I was having so much problem with the asthma. Wow. And after, as I say, I, I ended up uh, cutting out, there were 300 milligrams I was taking, and I cut it down to 100, and then after... The, the third uh, month that I was going to the acupuncturist, I cut the, the last one out and I've never taken it since. Wow, How, that's quite a story. And, you know, I would say you were ahead of your time in this kind of work um, and, and seeing that, you know, the traditional medicine isn't always maybe the best or first remedy to use some at times, right? Right, right. Um, and yeah. what would you say, because you were ahead of your time, what could you say from what you've learned and what you taught people 
um, about how a holistic center um, can be uh, considered as a form of uh, healing, well-being, um, and um, you know, preserving uh, healthcare really um, for people who might be more skeptical. Well, I think because now I think we're opening up to it more, right? But it's right, took a, right. taken a while. Yes. You know, when my wife started, there was very almost nothing around in the. Uh, there, there's a magazine that that's out, and I can't think of what it is, but it, it started in the 80s, hmm. and it basically started on the computer of the uh, holistic center, mm -hmm. but it wasn't. It was just a friend of my wife started that. The oh, I can't. Oh, is that Spirit magazine? Spirit, Spirit of Change. Yeah. Yes. Oh, Spirit Change. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's a great yeah. magazine. Yeah. yeah. And you were a practitioner yourself, right? Well, not really. I was I was sort of the, the support behind the scenes. I did, during the time I had the asthma, I was having a lot of problems and I took Reiki. Mm -hmm. And then over the years, I, I took, went to the level of Reiki master mm -hmm. and for helping myself. And I've also used it on, you know, on using it to help other people, yeah. but not, I did do, I do, yes, I actually at the holistic center, there was one of the ladies that, that had clients, she was a Reiki master. And when she traveled, I, I do things, I take over for her. Mm. But other than that, I was the one that, you know, carted the, the couches around and yes, did, whatever it was needed. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, I know, you know, I uh, have provided Reiki to hospice patients at the end of life. And I know that Reiki is in the hospitals now for patients who request it. So it is finally, um, you know, becoming more of mainstream. Well, how would you put that in a nutshell? What uh, Reiki offers people? Well, it was uh, it's something that people not, weren't open to it. Mm. I remember when I was at when I was working at Bose at, at the beginning of the holistic center. You know, I talk about things in the cafeteria, and people wouldn't wouldn't answer, wouldn't respond to it. Right. Mm -hmm. But if I'd walk down the hall, they'd look back and forth to see if anybody was around and they'd talk to me about it. Ah, yeah. And, Isn't that you know, interesting? and then it became more and more people started to understand it. And mm -hmm. yeah. it's something, well, as I had a talk with Dr. Bose one time and he says, just because we don't understand it doesn't mean it's, it doesn't, doesn't work. Doesn't, right. Doesn't you know, exist. And it, that's work. where new things come from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. I want to get to, I know the time goes by so fast. You have a fascinating story because I've heard one of your roundtable talks. Um, but I, you went, you decide, you and your wife decided to stop the holistic center and travel uh, across the country and get an RV. And you, I remember you saying just to help people. You, you felt like doing that at some point in your life. And uh, could you tell maybe a few minutes of what that was like and what you learned and experienced from it? Well, the first thing we did, well, what, what happened is the holistic center, my wife ended up being a manager of people. And she wanted to, she wanted to see clients, not people. So that the people that were working there. So we cut back to two, two rooms. And then my wife went down one time, it was a uh, massage therapist and a social worker still working with her. She went in and gave him the keys and said, it's yours. Mm -hmm. And that the massage therapist is still down there working. And uh, we we ended up buying an old Volkswagen bus. Oh, a, a bus. OK. Uh -huh. yeah, that was the first one that we had. And uh, that was the, called the healing bus. Ah. And we'd go around to uh, hospitals and, uh, you know, the AIDS drop in centers and things of that sort and help out and it was a, a just come and say can i help is that is that what you do right yeah well we'd go uh if we there was a, a fellow here from africa that ended up having getting cancer mm -hmm. and he was up here studying and my wife and two other ladies went in to him and told the nurses that they were going to do a little drumming so they shut the door and did some drumming and helped them and we went to uh, there's a detention center, boys detention center, or pre-release down in Dorchester, I think 13 to 17 year old boys. And we'd go there and we'd play music. And the one, whoever came, you know, there was no regular group of people, but there were a lot of people that had to do with the holist, I mean, with the, uh, yeah, the van, the van yeah. 
healing van and we'd call around whoever was available would come and make some music and yeah and i'd have to take that time off from work and i remember one time we'd get up at the beginning we'd get up at the in front of the kids and talk to them and to tell them who we were and one of the one of the boys said do you get paid for this and i said no he says why do you do it and at that point i really had never thought of that huh. i just did it because because i could i guess could and part of who you are i believe the both you and knowing your wife as well people committed to healing and helping others and you know i heard recently with all of our uh, all of the people afflicted by covid virus uh, the pandemic in our country um, that they were finding in hospitals, it was with a nurse they were demonstrating on TV when they held an, uh, a phone up to her uh, in her distress in ICU and she heard the sound of her sons talking to her, her vitals improved whenever they would do that. And I wonder if that might be in a way like music, there is something that you know, without your control can affect you like music. And we know of music therapy. We see how music can uh, help in uh, with healing with different kinds of people and people dealing with Alzheimer's in particular, they're showing now. So you again were ahead of your time on your, um, your bus and your RV healing across the nation. And I, I know you had amazing stories. Maybe someday you can you can have a show just to talk about that because I think it's fascinating. <laughs> but we have just a few more minutes. Um, I, I, I know people might be wondering what is behind you and how is that related to you? Is it related to your uh, connection to nature? Is that real? Is it alive? It, it, no, it's, <laughs> it's not. It was alive when the picture was taken. It's a crow. I have a friend that has, uh, she rescues birds and that's one of the, one of her rescue birds. And my native name ended up being crow feather ah. because mm -hmm. when one year we did a lot of, uh, a lot of looking around and wherever we went, there was a crow or wow. a crow feather or something. At a particular one. time or all your life? No, this was just one particular year. Okay. And, uh, I've always liked crows and the, the, uh, Somebody, my mother-in-law gave us a, a boat. The name of the boat was Fowl Hooker. And if you're a fisherman, that makes sense, but it just, we just didn't think that was, so we decided, and when we picked the boat up, there was a crow feather beside it. So we called it crow feather. Ah, uh -huh. and when they put the name on the back of the boat, there was, he had cut two of the vinyl uh, stick on things. And he said, what do you want me to do with the second one? And I said, I don't know. He said, how about if I put it in the back of your car? Mm -hmm. And the, the, uh, there was a teacher in this medicine society that I belonged to, a native group, that died you know, quite a few years ago. And about a year ago, somebody looked in, in his, uh, some papers that he'd written, and he gave me the name of Crow Feather. Oh, uh -huh. So that's, that's, I've been called Crow Feather ever since. Uh, and so, uh, so yeah. you got a gift as a, of a crow uh, as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it suits you. And I know that uh, I have seen you in other, uh, ha it looks like a hat on you now. And I know you are, uh, you're connected to nature is part of who you are. Um, uh, you spend time boating in the summer. Um, can you tell a little more about why nature is important to you and why it should be for people? Well, it, yeah, I think, you know, uh, housing is man-made. Mm -hmm. And when w the, the world outside of the house is, is really where everything is. You know, there's life out there. I mean, we do, we do things in our homes and all because we need them. But no, particularly on a day like today, you know, 20 degrees out, it's a lot warmer inside than out, but you can, you can be outside and you're, you're with the creator is really what it amounts to, mm -hmm. you know, and there's, there's just so much going on in the world and we don't, if we stay in our homes, that, that's sort of a good thing, but it's nice to get out and see the rest of the world and see what they're doing and, you know, maybe you can help some people, um, it, that's one of the things when we bought we when I retired we bought a motor home and we just that's we decided we were going to travel but our main thing of traveling was to see things and also if we could help people along the way right and not monetarily just you know sitting and talking to somebody or teaching them how to play a flute or something of that sort helps yeah. 
Yeah, that's very different. And it builds relationship and, and it builds community along the way. And right. I, I know you have been um, involved in different kinds of community, also helping with um, New England powwows that happen for First Nation people in this area. Um, yeah. And help uh, you do a bit of voting. And um, oh, I, and one thing I know about you also is you host a Chinese uh, New Year celebration, and you just you seem to be very welcoming, and you you kind of you open a, a whole room at a restaurant, a Chinese restaurant, and just welcome all the friends and you can think of, and and everybody gathers and they have food together and and make some music and tell some jokes and celebrate the Chinese New Year. Right. Yeah. And yeah. this year we're not going to be able to do it because no. of COVID. Right, right. But it's kind of like that ongoing uh, neighborhood uh, uh, that you are. Um, so uh, we have just a few minutes and you mentioned music is a part of your life. Uh, what do you find that you're doing in these days of uh, being at home, you know, and, and isolated from our usual, you know, uh, being with our community and people? How do you get by? Well, it, it just I, I do do a little bit of traveling outside of the house and you know go out and do some some shoveling and then every night i play the flute outside oh, uh -huh. and it's just something i started oh many many years ago yeah and you know the, a lot of the things that happen in the way i am these days is because of my wife she was the one that started the well we started it but she it was her idea to start the chinese new years uh -huh. And when we lived in Millis, we used to, we lived on a 200 acre farm and on the 4th of July and at Christmas, we'd have a party. And on the 4th of July with 200 acres, you could invite everybody. Yes, what a wonderful thing to do. And that's yeah. how you are very inclusive and, and uh, sharing art and food and healing. And we have just a few minutes left and we have often an experiential part. And I, what I know about you is you play beautiful flute and you play a beautiful didgeridoo. Can you tell folks who might not be familiar with a didgeridoo what it is and what the music is about? And then we'll maybe try to teach me because I happen to have one in the house. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, the didgeridoo, I've got one. Uh, I don't know if you can see it or not, but. Oh, yours is beautiful, a, a beautiful. And this from is, Australia? If it came from Australia, right. I, at, when I was working at Bose, we had people from Australia and they came up to visit and I asked him if he could get a didgeridoo for me. And this is what he's, he ended up sending to me. Oh, that's beautiful. And, and you it, make beautiful music with it. Yeah, I don't know if I can. I know it's a it. cramped quarters for this. I have to get back up. And... Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Wow. <laughs> I know it doesn't sound quite like it does in a studio when I've heard you, but it is a very deep felt uh, music to experience. And, uh, uh, you, and you are a fantastic didgeridoo player, I know. And sometimes you alternate between didgeridoo and flute. Um, could right. you play a, a tiny bit of your flute? I think you had brought it there too. Yeah, I, I, the, uh, I go to the powwows and I play, play the didgeridoo. And once in a while I'll play with people that have flutes and they introduce me as a bass flute. That is just beautiful. And I know you have brought that, the beauty of your flute to many events I've, I've been a part of. And I know you would also accompany your wife often when she would read poetry. Um, and um, uh, Iwata has passed a number of years now, right? 
right, four years yeah. ago. Four years ago, right. And you were able to do a beautiful program at HCAM TV, uh, sharing some of our poetry with your music, which I will always remember. And both of you are really a good friend to so many at HCAM Studios and the Hopkinton and Metro West community that I'm aware of, and, and really the New England from what I'm aware of too. <laughs> Uh, you have many friends, and uh, I think that is a healing way to be for us all, to bring us together. So I thank you for that and, and fond memories of your wife as well. Um, uh, at, oh, so uh, I don't know. Is there any last thing? We have two minutes. If I were to try the didgeridoo later, how would you quickly instruct me? Maybe 20 oh. seconds of instruction. Yeah, instruction to just... You, you know how a horse whinnies to go. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's basically all you do. You put, you put you your whinny. lips up again, yeah. again the, uh, the, the beeswax or whatever is at the end of it. Uh -huh. And you flap your lips. And, and that's it. it okay. It, that, that's all there is to it. And but then it, there's circular breathing, right? Which right. is no circular easy thing. Breathing is, that, that comes around along. <laughs> after a while. And I, I can, I can tell you how to do that, but it, it it's something that it's a head thing because yeah. you know when i started to play i was 50 i think or something and i was breathing in and out and i never tried to breathe in and out at the same time yeah, yeah. but the circular breathing is like the bagpipe bag you know when they have to breathe they squeeze the bag well the cheeks are the bag and you have you to play, practice play I, yeah, yeah yeah and you're very good at it and i uh, am glad to hear you're playing your flute these days mm -hmm. where we are uh, keeping to our homes and I wish you good days. We have less than a minute now. Any last uh, well wish for the world? What is it that you wish for the world uh, well, going even, forward? Even during these times, there are open mics, except they're on YouTube or, or Zoom and things of that sort. And they, and it's, it, people are still getting together. I, mm -hmm. I run a group that has to do with people that have had uh, experiences with ETs. And uh -huh. we, we couldn't get together. Uh -huh. We couldn't get together to see each other, but then it, we got on the Zoom mm -hmm. and two meetings ago went for four hours. So it's something that, you know, and it, it's really, you, people have to keep, get together.